My name is Sai and I am a I'm a consultant advisor with Belong and I'm also a criminologist and I identify as a Bahujan trans woman. Uh, Lekhi, uh, you want to take it up? Um, hi, I'm Lekhi. I'm an independent researcher and a writer. Uh, I used to teach in LSR sociology and I've been trained in social anthropology. Rina? Uh, Hi everyone, I am Murang Rina. I am a, a research scholar based in JNU. Other than that, I'm a human rights activist, uh, a feminist writer uh, from Arunachal. I am a former assistant professor at uh, DU, where I taught political science and international relations. Awesome. So uh, I think we can actually directly get into the biases. Uh, I will be reading out these biases that I have with me right now. The first bias that we'll be addressing today is that the COVID-19 virus is a Chinese virus. So uh, this is in context of how the Northeast people, uh, people from the Northeast recently have had multiple attacks, uh, racist attacks on them due to there uh, regarding what this virus and this pandemic actually means. Uh, so I will actually just go ahead and leave this, open this up to the facilitators to take up right now. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me begin with uh, my experience during the entire pandemic COVID-19 crisis. Uh, uh, before the entire country went to a lockdown, I remember taking a cab from my university to my friend's apartment here in, in uh, South Delhi. The cab driver uh, noticing me with my social makeup immediately told me, uh, or rather I think suggested that uh, all foreigners carry this virus. And by foreigners, he meant only certain Asian looking or Chinese looking people. And he suggested, very sternly that we kill them or burn them alive. In his language, foreigners uh, And that really, really, you know, uh, petrified me. There I was sitting in the cab and talking to this stranger, trying to reason him, you know, trying to tell him that that is not the reality. But to him, the only thing that the media and the misinformations that, you know, fed him was, all foreigners were carrying uh, this virus and, and to him foreigners meant only Chinese looking people. Um, so I think, uh, you know, this, uh, this uh, misinformation, fake news, uh, this culture of, you know, fake news has really fed into our minds and uh, it has uh, these incidents of racist attacks across the country. If you have been following the news, the number of uh, attacks uh, on race related from uh, in, in New Delhi to Ahmedabad to Bangalore, Mysore, Mumbai, Kolkata. Many have been beaten up, evicted. Uh, you know, these are all instances that have uh, uh, sort of uh, reinforced a lot of uh, things that th this country was already. Uh, uh, familiar with this is these are not new uh, uh, racist attacks we we this, this country has an old history or, or or rather in my language i would say uh, an old triest with hate crimes based on varied identities such as race caste class sex religion and all of that but i think uh, this this recent incident with covid-19 pandemic has just been such an unfortunate series of events which has uh, uh, reinforced the latent biases that uh, all of us carry Yeah, Liki, yeah. you would want to uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely completely agree with you. The fact is that, uh, first of all, uh, this idea of COVID-19 mm -hmm. being a Chinese virus, I don't think it's specific to India, this sort of perception. It is global. Mm -hmm. When you have uh, the president of one seemingly most powerful country in the world, say, call it the Chinese virus. So you know that already uh, COVID-19 has been uh, from its inception, at least in global media, has been seen as um, 
as being caused coming from a particular region, coming from a particular race, but very particularly coming also uh, coming from a, uh, a specific kind of political uh, regime, specific kind of culture, and so on. Right. So, um, so there is uh, an already uh, 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 there is a systemic bias that is already present. There is a perception, a global perception that is already there. And what this bias basically says is that, uh, first of all, people don't care to know whether it is so-called Chinese or not. Uh, what they care, what what we are seeing right now is basically the impunity of these biases, the impunity of racism, right? I don't think people are ignorant. And I, I really think that uh, it's, uh, that there might be a good number of people who might not know about the Northeastern part of India, Indians who might not know about the Northeastern part of India. But I think a majority of people in Delhi, at least cities in metropolitan, of course, are clearly know what is the Northeast, right? Uh, there's an economy that is built on Northeastern youngsters who come and live and rent their places, come to the educational institutions. Um, there are uh, 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 reservations, domicile reservation. People know that, right? So, so it's not uh, really what this bias basically tells us. It's telling nothing, us, nothing about the coronavirus. It is telling us about the racism, but the impunity of this racism that you can actually call someone a Chinese, right? There is no need to call someone a Chinese, even a Chinese a Chinese outside of a Chi outside of China or even within China, right? It is this 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 whole idea that you can call it and get away with it. You can call a a a, a section that is for them rightfully. Uh, uh, condemned. In this case, it could be China, it could be Nepal, it could be the Northeast, it could be anything, right? Uh, uh, the Dalits, trans. The fact is, you can get away with, with it by saying it, right? So, first mm -hmm. of all, COVID virus is not, not Chinese. Second of all, I don't think people, uh, uh, really, people who are behind this racist attacks really care to know whether it's Chinese or not, right? Uh, it is a virus. More than a race, what it actually uh, represents this virus is the fact that we're li living in a highly globalized world. People are moving. You cannot stop them. Capital doesn't stop, right? Uh, 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 the fact that if you look at Wuhan, also if you want to look at the origin, um, at least there's this one article where it says that Wuhan's staple meal were not these exotic food. It's because people gained capital over time. It's a particular kind of economic global system that allowed people to, to flaunt their riches. And these exotic animals were brought in a way uh, to show and impress a lot of time foreigners, ironically. Right. So, so uh, we uh, and that is basically uh, uh, the larger picture that we have to look at, along with the fact that, yes, there is a, an, an, an impunity, impunity in, in racism and any form of discrimination where people think they can just get away with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would like to add something, uh, you know, with what Lakey left right now, is it's, it's uncanny to even uh, relate how the epicenter of the entire virus has been in Wuhan, but the Northeastern Indians are being targeted for this. This is an absurd relation that people have established mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and and to also again re reinstate the point that Lakey made you know we live in such a consumerist capitalist world and if anybody that has to be blamed it is us who have tribal histories but not certain communities because I think it's very easy to just pinpoint at any communities for any 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 fault that happens in the in the society and I think that's that's a very wrong message that uh, we we are uh, carrying on here at the cost of human lives and dignity yeah um just like th th that that is actually so true like listening to Lekhi and Reena the point happens that many a times when issues such as this come up and there are very targeted attacks at marginalized communities it is always an excuse of ignorance that is yeah. used yeah. to justify these actions but at the same time we have to understand that this is systemic in so many different ways and this is not the evolution of something completely new or unseen before uh, racist attacks in india are literally the norm and not the exception and this does not excuse uh, people trying to trying to justify the actions of some uh, as ignorance or as just paranoia this is not paranoia this is not fear. 
this is yeah. structural racism and people discriminate and are violent because they want to not because they are being forced to by any other emotion than just their racism so yeah uh, we can yeah. right now move on to the next myth uh, this myth thankfully uh, durina and lekhi guys is completely busted it is a complete farce to call this covid 19 a chinese virus and uh, even if yeah. presidents prime ministers and dots this we call bullshit uh, mm. so <laughs> the next myth that we would be addressing is that people from the northeast are all alike uh, and i think yeah i'll just leave it up to lekhi and reena to address this uh so so i think my uh, uh, this is something that we're all we have uh, every person from the northeast be it from any state that right? we have been battling this in our everyday life outside of the northeast and various metropolitan cities particularly uh, and uh, and it is quite um, uh, it is so i am conflicted half the time right because it does come with here i would say that it does come with some kind of lack of knowledge right and this lack of knowledge uh, partially comes from the fact that systematically northeast has been completely invisibilized like when i was studying uh i had no textbook that spoke about us in any sense we had one book of social science where we had um a different i still remember we had different states right and each chapter was looking at each state a uh, committed to each state uh, but there was a last section called the northeast right mm. whereas each other state had like uh seven to eight pages committed to them one state each each northeast had just two three pages committed to it but i was excited to see arunachal pradesh because i also come from arunachal pradesh on the paper so we never really read that chapter right mm -hmm. and that was like a meek uh, attempt but i don't think that's true for anywhere else i don't think anywhere have we read about our history yeah, right yeah. so I so agree. we uh, so people who actually get this myth right because uh, this is a myth um also i think i we need to contextualize these myths this myths are built outside of the northeast right by people who are not from the northeast sometimes uh, uh, uh reinforced by people who are uh, who call themselves representatives of this region mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so in this case uh, uh, so this is one systemic problem and others of course uh, there is uh, partially also a lot of laziness people don't want to know right we don't want to know the difference between uh, nagaland and manipur right we don't want to know the, dif uh, the the kind of the differences that you find within the northeast and so on right uh, so we are not same we are like any other society we are complicated right we are uh, uh, there are many things that are uh, uh, that needs improvement that is that needs criticism that needs to be uh, 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 reformed at the same time we have we are like any other society we have many things to preserve many things to be proud of many things uh, and one of them is differences right that uh, that in the northeast we are uh, we are all the same through the lens of uh, the mainstream right uh, uh, mm. but uh, I, uh, and we would however maintain that we are uh, very different right and we are not different in that violent conflicting manner alone there is a history of conflicts yes but we are different like any one of us any other society uh, uh, mm. is different right so so the fact that north east is also a lot of time it's a misnomer i call it a misnomer they use mm -hmm. it to just club this eight uh uh state eight, uh, eight places together and push them away regardless of the fact that each and every state had a very different relationship with what we call today india like this integrated india sikkim had a different relationship uh, arunachal had a very different relationship from its neighbors and so on and so forth uh, so so of course uh, 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 we are uh, we are not the same politically uh, history culturally uh, but that does not mean that uh you know that uh, we all are alien and isolated from each other that's also we're just like any other uh, uh peoples mm. no adding on to what lekhi said uh, i agree with her you know the entire northeastern region is always uh, understood and contextualized through the lens of mainstream uh, and and always painted the entire region as one single entity 
uh, which is which is wrong and i think it's dangerous because then it does not does not allow uh, does not allow a clear understanding of the region and its history uh, you know we always talk about the idea of incredible india even you know people when they go abroad they, they we we take so much pride in being uh, calling ourselves as indians and all of that but when we when we reflect on what's happening in the country it's i think it's it's a nobody is willing to uh, look beyond their comfort zone nobody is willing to read and understand uh, the communities beyond them and that is where we are failing uh, this region has eight states a lot of people don't even know that they only count the seven states then we have more than 220 ethnic groups uh, uh, we all speak uh, different dialects languages uh, which no way resembles one another that itself is also uh, that that shows how diverse we are we have different cultural political historical significance uh, dance music we all differ from one another um, so in no way this region can be put together or clubbed together as one single entity but uh, if if you really are interested and have the political will i think uh, this region can and will show so much than what we understand <laughs> sorry did not unmute myself uh so that that's actually so true this actually reminds me of this conversation we were having in the previous bust your bias uh, episode where we were talking about why are communities even homogenized right whenever somebody is trying to understand a marginalization or oppression there is always this tendency to homogenize that community for the understanding of the other for the understanding of the oppressor right mm -hmm. the point is it is complicated i'm sorry we, we we can try to simplify it for you to understand but then we cannot homogenize it to an extent that we lose our identities we cannot homogenize it to an extent that we lose our lived realities which might be very very diverse right so that's completely true i think uh, both of you have put it together extremely well and uh, where people just need to self inform after a point of time and i don't think the burden should continuously lie mm -hmm. to justify continuously that we are not homogeneous and we yeah. are not defined by your limited understanding of us right and it is the burden is not on us to basically continuously try to uh, inform you right yeah. but at the same time yes completely agreed uh, with all of what you both said and this myth guys is officially busted i don't think this required uh, it was very obvious uh, that people are in general not alike that people from various communities and various regions differ drastically so yeah uh, we will move on now to our next myth and that is that people from the northeast eat everything including humans uh in quotes so yeah i'm just going to leave that up for reena and lika now dekh you know reena you want to say something <laughs> <laughs> you start no like <laughs> you know sometimes uh, when this is posed uh, at me and this happened uh, we all have an anecdote it's funny and it's really yeah. sad right um uh, you know there are certain things that we all uh, certain social identities and positions we all occupy and both reena and i and all three of us i guess occupy somewhere uh, a certain social class that uh, seems to be uh, uh, theoretically should have uh, protected us from certain kinds of you know um, uh, unpleasant experiences right uh, but you find you see that how uh, when certain identities are marked it has a way to seep into even the most so called secure uh, places right so i was taking a flight back from guwahati to um, delhi and i met this guy who was clearly traumatized and um, so he started talking to me and he was of course shocked that i could speak hindi so well and so on and so forth i grew up uh, 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 i grew up in delhi most of my life which is why i speak like this right which is why i have this 
not only I speak Hindi well, I have this particular lilt and accent, whatever. And he was, of course, like, like everyone else, he was surprised. And then he was, of course, traumatized. So I, I, I thought, I think he found a counselor in me and he said, I was in Assam and the guy had no job. He had one opportunity to get a job in Assam by some relative or distant whatever relative or known person and he said but I did not get out of the hotel for three days because someone told me that you they eat everything including humans too (laughs) right Mm. so uh, he lost his employment right so so uh, as as his any chance of uh, livelihood and I said did anyone come to you with that kind of uh, an energy or why did anyone attack you right and he said no I never left the room right uh, uh, so you uh, you find like the and the fact that he could say it to me he knows that I'm from the northeast so instead of asking me whether you guys eat everything right he assumed so so then I was I was pretty shocked to find that there's someone who there are some people who actually really believe this uh, that we eat you that we are cannibals right uh, but however, now this is like, I still mm-hmm. find that uh, that is still uh, this kind of encounter uh, of someone being so scared and not leaving out and where near the table's turn in, in a very like dark comedy uh, uh, sort of a plot where the, 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 this, uh, the, the so-called savage suddenly has uh, threatens the so-called oppressor and oppressor and so on and so forth. But in reality, then uh, the, the maximum number of times I am asked this question or my friends are asked this question is by people who, uh, who again, know the answer, right? Uh, for me, the question has always been that, uh, that, I mean, honestly, we always we have this question, so what, right? So what? what uh, the uh, our eating habits should it define our identity right and i'm not here to justify and i'm not going to justify that i am vegetarian or i'm vegan or 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 we eat meat but we don't eat this kind of meat we don't, or or we eat meat and so on and so forth right that those kind of conversations are are everywhere right i would always like to contextualize in our social and historical moment and that is the question of eating habits whenever linked to an identity has always been linked to the identity of the marginalized of the uh, 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 of the second class citizen right that is not the northeastern alone of course it's also the muslims who have been questioned about their dietary habits right and so uh, and it's amazing to see a lot of time that uh, uh, that people appropriate uh, uh, you know the 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 language of ethics the language of animal rights uh to actually reinforce biases against the oppressed against the marginalized sections of the society right mm-hmm. uh, uh that that um, and that is uh, that is something that keeps uh, uh annoying me right that this is this is what uh, that they try and bring ethics into it they try and bring the question of civilization into it and so on and so forth right uh, but for me the question of uh, eating that we eat everything and so on and so forth uh, uh, I like Sai had also said I am also exhausted by it because uh, like everyone else eating habits are changing but like every other culture people want to continue some of their eating habits right and if there is a question of ethics, then I think we need a completely different session. We need a different way of talking about ethics, talking about cruelty, or talking about uh, anything. But uh, but I'm not going to have this conversation if you're going if you, if your argument in any way is going to diminish uh, what act, what happens to human. If you're going to erase humanity from it, uh, then at least uh, personally, I would never take that conversation further. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Likhi. I I completely agree with you on a lot of issues. Um, you know, we, I mean, culturally, we grew up eating everything. If I can say, I grew up eating all the non-vegetarian meats and everything. Um, but bringing back that question on, uh, you know, the 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 idea of ethics in in the dietary habits of certain communities. I think it is also to do with the idea of purity again. You know, uh, a vegetarian 
or uh, or someone yeah. who's not eating meat is always considered pure and clean definitely and all the diseases that are brought in by by communities who eat a lot of non vegetarians um so i think that's another myth that one needs to really look at it in a scientific manner rather than you know looking it through the lens of a prejudice biased uh, stereotyping um i i don't have much to add here i think uh, eating dietary habits should be more in terms of uh, a calculative decision in terms of health and <laughs> mental peace and not you know uh, painting one one uh, uh, community or one culture as savage or uncivilized and who eat everything and anything including humans and i don't get this point because this is ridiculous i don't think uh, any communities in this country practice cannibalism yeah <laughs> Yeah, we don't eat humans. If that. Yeah. <laughs> Sai, over to you. <laughs> yeah, I think that was a perfect conclusion to uh, <laughs> that myth. And uh, yeah, I think, yeah, both what Reena and Lethi have been pointing out. Yeah, mainland India largely is a caste society. right and in caste societies yeah. we have this obsession with uh, defining everything to through purity and pollution and mm-hmm. we have this habit of talking about people and their social stature on the basis of what food they eat and how they eat it etc right uh, this idea of purity and pollution you cannot actually go and apply everywhere point number 1 and point number 2 this idea of purity and pollution is mythical <laughs> so i think uh, when you try to convert these Uh, built up ideas in your head to translate into real life biases and discrimination against people we should put a check on ourselves and try to figure out where exactly do these beliefs hinder other people's rights right and you can have these beliefs by yourself maybe but as long as they do not hinder other people's rights and don't turn into like active forms of discrimination uh, you you really need to be careful of that and this is a message from like every community that has been marginalized in india let it be dalits let it be bahujans let it be uh, people who are uh, religiously yeah. minorities in india muslims uh, so yeah i think it's like a cohesive call from everybody that this myth is busted <laughs> so uh, <laughs> we will actually go on to the next bias now uh, to talk about yes so all the people from the northeast are uncivilized so uh lekhi rena on to you to address this now hmm. <laughs> i've always been giving you uh, i mean yeah 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 this idea of uh, the dot east is being uncivilized uh i mean uh, we all know this 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 binary between the civilized and the uncivilized is a very modern binary that it's a very recent invention right brought in by colonialism right uh, that it somewhere legitimized uh, uh, a systemic oppression and exploitation of land people and culture right and there by their histories along with it right so so uh, um i always want to know what do they mean by uncivilized in uh, mainland india when they say we are uncivilized what do they mean by it and uh, It, what i have uh, uh, realized is what they often mean by it is how you will be accepted in a civil society so you have to in, in a society so so you have to follow the norms right and we flout uh, all kinds of norms this is of course can be of course linked to the to the meat eating and the man eating and all that eating uh, uh, um uh, a perception about the naughty so what you eat is also somewhere related to where you are in the hierarchy of civilization right mm. um uh, and uh, apart from that uh, the, the, but if you look at in the different contexts that we use uh, in in metropolitan city when they say uncivilized they also mean i feel like they also mean uh, how are you supposed to act how are you supposed to uh, dress how are you supposed to uh, uh, behave and follow all the norms right um this the third thing where i think this uh, this whole bias and actually the myth of the north is being uncivilized is uh, is uh, is largely based on highly narrow parameters of what makes a society modern and civilized right mm-hmm. 
and these parameters are uh, 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 written history right uh, many uh, societies within the northeast do not have a, 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 a textual tradition of history but rather an oral tradition of history uh, it's about how you are dressed same thing what do you eat and so on and so forth right now this again at the same time gets uh, further complicated because these parameters of of civilized what is a civilized society and what is a modern society is also then bent uh, around right so if a civilized society i mean uh, here we are hearing that uh, a, a highly progressive modern society is where you're going to find uh, uh, that uh, that women are, are are treated with respect that women have some kind of autonomy some kind of freedom right uh, then i think that in that respect then many of this mainland uh, uh, societies fail to be so called modern progressive civilized right so so this arbitrarily using the term civilized uh, to of course uh, look at us as barbaric is a very colonial and outdated model of looking at the northeast uh, and and in any ways we need to start questions high time we need to start questioning what do we mean by uh, a, a civilized society right hmm. you know, i yeah i agree with like like he uh, i think uh, this this bust uh, sorry this bias that we are trying to bust uh, right now is a continuation of the last point that we talked about you know the eating habits the dietary habits of a certain community <clears throat> um, i think like and i will almost share the same point you know it's it's the, the concept of civilization what is civility is always being uh, defined through the lens of the oppressors um, uh, you know uh, communities that are being labeled as uncivilized are always being seen as who are socially culturally and i don't know if the word morally fits in we, we we have not you know attained certain kind of advanced advancement that uh, the, the so called oppressor uh, lists so so that is something uh, that that i to me to me that comes to my mind um but but then you know when i'm trying to also understand this concept at at at, at in today's time uh, how do you define uh, civility uh um, do you say a literate person is civilized or an educated person so called is civilized but we will see a very literate person behaving in a very um uncivilized manner but that person will never be called as an uncivilized person but um uh, i don't know if you can find the term uh but but to me the question is it it it, it cannot be uh, used used to label a community uncivilized anymore i think it's more like individuals and societies that uh, that really need to reflect on their attitudes and behaviors rather than uh, you know uh, branding the entire uh, communities or regions as northeast in this case being labeled as uncivilized uh, because right now with the corona virus instances that you have seen who is behaving uncivilized here you know Uh, taking out people from homes uh, evicting them spitting on them beating them up i think this is not any trait of civilization or civility that we can talk about here so i think that is something that we really need to talk about rather than still holding on to very very uh, primitive terms like uh, uncivilization or something which is a very colonial uh, 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 term you yeah. know yeah actually i think that there is also like a huge interrelation between how uh, the population strength of indigenous communities in the northeast and the way in which the idea of tribes has been defined in indian polity and indian society uh, largely is as people who are far away from or detached from mainstream society and are hence there are these notions about indiv- indigenous and adivasi populations even when we take about uh, talk about cases like jharkhand hmm. right which is predominantly uh, an adivasi population uh, in mainland india and even people from jharkhand are considered uncivilized mm-hmm. right this this idea of civilization uh, also has like a lot yeah. to do with yeah. i'll give it up to lekhia 
Yeah, uh, my, I, I was also thinking this, uh, the notion of the uncivilized and the barbaric, which we use, uh, which we see uh, often um, people in power, the state also uses it in uh, mm-hmm. in, a, in very yeah. conspicuous manner. It, it, it is also very uh, modern. It fits, uh, it fits certain forces. It's fitting to call the Northeast uncivilized and barbaric. It was very fitting to call it uh, in the 80s and the 90s, where you saw very... Uh, uh, clear resistance to the Indian state from the Northeast. Uh, uh, It's very fitting to call the Adivasis in Jharkhand uncivilized because they don't know what development means, right? Uh, Mm. Their their idea of uh, uh, their relationship with land and forest is is different, right? So this Mm. uncivilized and barbaric we're we're seeing is we're seeing how these colonial terms get appropriated and reappropriated by various uh, 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 systems of power right uh, and they're used in different contexts and different contexts are always fits right in in the for instance uh, uh, it, it it serves the purpose of the power to call the northeasterns uncivilized therefore it's rightful to send the indian army there and you know control these barbaric whatever so so it's also very uh, it serves contemporary purposes also hmm. I'll actually uh, thank you so much for uh, these inputs and I think this myth is officially busted. This doesn't make any sense to talk about civilization at a time where people have lost all sanity and are, you know, in, in times where we have a chance to show global humanity at a time where we have a chance to stick and abide by principles that raise hope, that talk about, uh, you know, ways in which we could uh, show solidarity and strength to each other to be able to get get through a natural calamity which has stricken us. We choose to use this opportunity to discriminate, be violent and further marginalize certain communities. Uh, It just absolutely makes no sense. And using civilization and non-civilized as a marker of trying to justify this behavior is I think even more uh, indignified for a community that claims to be civilized. So yeah, this myth is completely busted. Thank you so much, both of you. Uh, We can actually move on to the next myth now, which is uh, that Northeastern women are promiscuous and Northeastern men are addicts. So yeah, I'll just leave it to both of you. (laughs) Lekhi. (laughs) Bolo, Rina. Okay. Um, Yeah, this this is what we do privately. When these things are said, we laugh. Yeah. Ridiculous, but okay. It has real... Hmm. Yeah, uh, I think, again, you know, it's... It's it's, it's so... It's, again, to me, so uncanny that the entire region, uh, women and men categorized separately as women as promiscuous men as drug addicts or uh, losers who just party and don't have any you know passion or creative life and they're just here to party and not have any uh, productive life and that is something so bizarre i don't know where this comes from i don't think this has anything to do with the region it is individual characteristics and personalities that uh, go on to make uh you know uh, go that you go on to make making your life uh, whatever you want to achieve in life uh, but having said that yes uh, uh, women being labeled as easygoing sluts uh, sorry to use this term here but i think that is something that all of us from the region have uh, experienced i mean i for one i could give tons of experiences where how many times i have been uh, touched, groped, molested by men uh, because they thought uh, because I think to them when I say them, I'm sorry, I'm you know sort of bringing uh, uh, a sort of uh, uh, division here. But then the point is, I think to a lot of, especially men, um, they see women from the northeast as uh, easygoing and perceive us as someone who are willing to. Uh, let go of our morality uh, for for various reasons that that, that they know, know of. Uh, how many times, like I was sharing, I've been asked uh, by random men, "What's your price? You know, do you want to sleep with me?" And these are men who I don't even know. I have never come across. So 
and it and it's almost on an everyday basis that you go through this and then you begin to wonder is it is it that every woman in this country go through that yes i know for sure as women as a second class gender in this country we do go through this but at the same time uh women with a particular social makeup and identity will go through uh just uh, more than uh or 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 to to put it in another way a woman of certain social makeup and identity will have a different kind of experience than other women i'm sorry if that sounds uh uh not convincing but that is what me and many from the region have felt uh, uh the the this uh, you know the moral compass that uh, is being always talked about about the women of the northeast that is ridiculous and that uh, that is something that uh, people should not uh, do and coming to to men and boys from the region uh, i think it's again it's, it's a very sad affair that uh, boys and men from the region are also uh, looked at through that lens uh uh again i will reiterate that point it has nothing to do with communities it's always individuals who choose to have a certain kind of lifestyle or define their idea of life and i don't think it's uh, correct to paint the entire regions boys and girls you know and categorizing them as loose or like lacking more morality and all of that sort yeah what do you think lekhi yeah um uh so these are like two sections in a way how men are looked at and how women are looked at from the north uh, of uh, those coming from the northeast in mainland india so this whole idea of women northeast and women being promiscuous mm. i think uh how this this kind of bias is accessible to uh to everyone in the everyday life is uh is something to do with how they think a women should behave mm. right how they think a women should a a a a a a an honorable woman rather right mm. not just any woman right it has to be an honorable woman right so so an honorable woman how should she conduct herself in the public what should she be wearing how should she be talking where should she be and where she should not be right mm. now um in the northeast uh you uh you would find that uh now one is not claiming there's no patriarchy in northeast and there's mm. no gender norms They're laid out very clearly and differently in different uh, communities however uh you uh, it is not uncommon to see women moving around right uh, uh the mobility of women are is not uncommon right in the region right and uh, and when young women from this region go out to different urban uh, cities right uh, uh, my for instance my father never told me not to move around not to wear certain things not to talk in a certain way and so on and so forth of course there were gender norms which were very clearly distinguished between what i am supposed to do what am i expected or what my brothers are expected of but in terms of mobility and so on how to present myself uh, there were uh, uh no strict norms that would apply right so what we are seeing here is how again the same thing how uh, uh where these biases get produced from the standpoint where these biases get produced you find uh, the same kinds of norm that are being imposed on women from the northeast region and the other thing that we have to keep in mind is of course where uh, i will tie in the second part of men are addicts is mm -hmm. that the northeastern region has had a very uh, difficult and a conflicted relationship uh, with the indian state and with uh, uh, with the the uh, the different processes that brought in notions of modernity notions of uh, uh, development into the northeast right so a lot mm -hmm. of young women who get out of northeast are also doing it for education reason and for economical reason they want there's also due to employment that people are are here right so women work these are working uh, uh, uh women right so so you find that uh, again is the same thing of getting away with you can just label someone something and and you can get away with it because you can because you have the power because these people are uh, outside of their uh, native region and they are there for 
much more vulnerable where they are. They are also looking at a very highly vulnerable uh, group of people coming from different classes, right? We also have different classes of people from the Northeast coming in. They're not like this utopic society where there's no class. Uh, mm. And that links to this other notion of men being addicts, right? Or to put it more crudely, it's not only men being addicts, there's also this, uh, in the mainstream, uh, uh, there is this a very covert notion that Northeastern men are not manly enough, mm. right? Northeastern men are, are not doing their duties or being productive or being whatever, whatever their norm of masculinity is, which is, of course, always uh, uh, already highly, highly uh, 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 imprisoning, right? So, so this idea of uh, men being drug addicts and so on, it comes from this kind of perception that uh, you know, it's also again linked to women. You don't see your women. You don't have no control over your women, right? Um, uh, and so on and so forth. So, so you get all of that linked uh, there, right? And, and you see certain news also become a huge perception, a huge myth that persists the indoors time, right? Uh, and uh, we have to see that we are not denying that there have not been a, an addiction problem in the Northeast. And this is not only in the Northeast, you see it in Punjab, in Northeast, you see it in Mizoram and so on. And there has been, but these are not uh, just because some people are, some men are useless or some people are useless or, or, uh, or, or unintelligent. It's just because the situation was such in the Northeast for the longest time, we were in conflict the whole time, right? Development didn't mean the same things to us. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, nationalism didn't mean the same thing to, uh, to us. So in that kind of conflict, you'd find, of course, uh, uh, which is happening even today, the youth, the youngsters are the ones who, who have so much energy to expand and the young, youngsters in that sense are the ones who have so much to lose, right? So all these uh, problems that you uh, find even in the Northeast are also uh, historic, need to be historicized. Mm. Yeah. Can I add something, Sai, here? Uh, you know, I we, just have yeah. one quick announcement to make. Uh, so we have uh, opened up the group chat. If anybody has questions, we will start taking questions from around 12.30. And we'll be hurrying up a little bit with the myths. We have like three more myths to mm. go, so I think we'll be... Okay. Yeah, okay. One quick line I want to add here because we could keep going on and on about this, but I think uh, uh, a lot of uh, responsibility has also to be shouldered by the mainstream media and popular culture because the, the representation is awful and a lot of time uh, uh, it's, it's misrepresentation. You see a lot of uh, movies uh, where we will always see uh, roles from the Northeast uh, men and women in a very uh, stereotypical way and that remains yeah. that's it I mean that is something that remains with us throughout our lives and uh, every yeah. uh, every young woman from the Northeast is an easy going promiscuous woman and every every man is a drug addict a guitarist who is just hanging by the bar and not doing anything so I think you know that also needs to be addressed and what Leakey said, you know, uh, with, with years of conflict in the region, a lot, we have lost a lot of years to development. We have a lo lost a lot of years to, uh, uh, you know, peace. So we have youngsters who have lost a lot of, uh, of their times uh, where they could have used productively for studies, uh, for knowledge, for employment, but we have lost a lot. So I think all of these uh, uh, issues also needs to be addressed holistically. Mm. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, Leki and Rina, for this. Actually, uh, that that these notions that are on one hand gendered and on the other hand talk about the usefulness or uh, you know how uh, relevant, not relevant, how productive how they are ideal productive citizens these these two definitions of creating ideal productive citizens and about how certain genders are supposed to be performing their roles etc are prevalent beyond belief and they are built on such patriarchal and sexist notions that it, it cannot even we cannot even begin to comprehend how deep rooted these this these kind of biases are 
Hmm. But yes, uh, for the purpose of this myth that Northeastern women are promiscuous and men are addicts, I think we have successfully busted this. So if ever any of you who are watching this uh, feel that you are uh, mirroring this kind of bias, then please check yourself once and maybe refer back to this conversation sometime. Um, so we are going ahead to our next myth, which is that Northeastern women are empowered. This is something that was already talked about by uh, Lekhi to a certain extent in the previous myth. So yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, this whole idea of Northeastern women are uh, em empowered and you find it everywhere. And, and it's very interesting how, how the term empowered just like uh, uh, just like uh, feminism is again co-opted by patriarchy by all these forces of power you know it's, it's similar to saying when you call uh, when you think that a northeastern woman is always already promiscuous it's like saying hey you are a feminist right you should be okay with this and so on and so forth right so it's like um, it's almost like use this idea of empowerment and feminism is used for gaslighting a lot of often times right so bringing that point in mind but this myth uh, or rather this bias that uh, everyone all women in northeastern uh, in northeastern societies in, in is empower while it seems like a very positive bias right it is a bias nonetheless it is a bias that does not want to uh, understand the complexity of the societies in the northeast it is a bias that will actually is actually very dangerous I think uh, uh, because it does not allow us to question the gender norms that are already in place in various societies in the Northeast, albeit differently, right? This bias, of course, comes from, I think, from uh, this idea that you have matriarchal societies mm -hmm. in Northeast, right? We don't have matriarchal societies. Matriarchy, like patriarchy, means focus of power, the focal of power. No, we have matrilineal, right? Uh, that too in very few societies. We have Khati society, in Meghalaya particularly, right? What we mean by matrilineal is not the focal of power, but the focal of lineage, right? That uh, we trace our, uh, that uh, somewhere the women is counted uh, um, upon and so on. Now this, I have to tell you that here also, we have to look at the case of Meghalaya, right? Which is often used by people as an example to show how Northeastern women are so empowered, is that there is a very good and happy lobby happening in uh, uh, amongst uh, in Meghalaya of men right who are saying that we don't want matrilineal anymore to be to be uh, now modern and so on we have to do that away right uh, uh, so uh, so you have patriarchy there are patri uh, so so patriarchy just like um, capitalism is very inventive and very different in different places right so we have very clear gender norms if you start looking at it the decision makers in most of our families is the male members of the society be it the father be it the uncle depending on which northeastern community you're from right if you look at the political scenario the 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 uh, mainstream political scenario in the northeast which i think reena will elaborate later uh, the the if you start looking at the gender division there i mean like the composition of women in that is abysmal right if you look at uh, various things so i i feel like um, in the northeast the idea of uh, a, a, uh, that it should not be interchangeable to women's empowerment in the Northeast. There's no utopia going there, but rather there's a lot of conversation that is uh, that is required, right? If you look at how how uh, mothers are controlled, if you look at how uh, women are controlled, you and this is not only men. You also see women at the forefront of uh, reproducing certain kinds of gender norms, right? So, uh, so you have that also in the Northeast. It is not uh, exactly the same as the rest of India, right? But there is very clear gender norms, but there is very clear uh, uh, power disparity uh, between uh, men and women in the Northeast. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, continuing with what Lekhi has uh, put it so well, uh, you know, this is the biggest myth that uh, this country has about the region that women are empowered. Uh, Liki and I and many others that I know in our group, we, we have been working on the grounds for women's and women's rights. Uh, it is as patriarchal as the rest of the world, not just the country. And 
the tribal customary laws in few states are, uh, to be honest, the most patriarchal institution that one could uh, think of and uh, which has not allowed women to have uh, freedom and liberty in, in all sense that you can think of. <clears throat> um, uh, my sister and I, we run a small organization where we have been working on the ground trying to empower, empower women uh, uh, financially, economically, uh, by, by, by giving them uh, some a handful of skill development opportunities that, that they could help themselves, you know, be empowered with. Uh, the literacy rate is very, very low when it comes to, uh, uh, in, in comparison with the men. Uh, now you will see a lot of uh, factors like child marriage, uh, polygamy, uh, all of this that, that were uh, uh, an old, old tradition, but we know for sure because we have been working on the ground to know, to, to say that it is still happening and it still happens. A lot of uh, media reports are not able to bring this out uh, because a lot of times all these uh, assaults uh, on women are also happening within the family. Um, so one does not know where to go. If at all few reports do come out, uh, a lot of times um, the, the, the tribal tribe and clan politics comes into play and one has to compromise with uh, you know, with the situation. And so a lot of times uh, these news and reports never go out. Um, then, uh, 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 yeah, the, the point that Lakey has already talked about, the confusion between matriarchal and matrilineal. And that is something that a lot of us have always been asked. You know, when we go to social events here, public events, talks, lectures here in Delhi and other universities across uh, uh, Delhi, we are always, the first question they ask is, oh, you women are so empowered, we like the way you dress, we like the way you talk and all of that. But does that really reflect on our position as being empowered in the society? You know, that is something we've all been questioning every single day. Uh, I think to me, if, if, if you talk about empowerment, empowerment, I think the most important point is, uh, do we have decision-making capability? Uh, we don't have that. Uh, uh, and I'm, I'm, I've been on the, uh, as a student activist myself, uh, who've contested elections in the past, uh, I know how many women are uh, as political leaders in the Northeastern region. There, we are only a handful of women who are able to do this. Uh, most of the times it's your husbands that would not be supportive. And if at all you are a good candidate, you will have uh, many rules and restrictions imposed on you. First is, you, you cannot uh, marry an outsider. That is another discourse altogether that we could go on and on. Uh, so as again, as female leaders, you will have to tick a lot of boxes to be even accepted as a good leader. That is there. So a lot of, lot of elements that needs to be seen uh, into uh, when, when, before we accept or you know, blindly accept this uh, phrase that women are empowered in the Northeast. So that is, uh, that this particular discourse really needs to be busted. Uh, yes. And I'm not sure if this uh, 10 minutes uh, you know, talk on this could really help, but I think it's a great beginning. Uh, uh, Lake and I, last time we did in your, uni in your college, we did a session on uh, who, who are Northeast, who, uh, who is a Northeastern woman. And I remember the classroom being filled and so many questions of young girls, because for them, uh, they, were, they were always told, uh, when I say told, they must have read it somewhere that women in the Northeast are so empowered. And, you know, going back to the reiterating that point, we do occupy public spaces. You will see a lot of women, the mobility is there, but that does not really translate into economic and yeah. political empowerment. Yeah. So that really needs to be uh, busted. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Rina and Lekhi, for this conversation. Actually, it's a very pertinent conversation to the present times. Also, because uh, I think when the questions of gender are raised uh, within the context of multiple marginalities of not just gender, but maybe of race, of region, of uh, ethnicity and various other uh, allied marginalities, then it always becomes a multi-faced battle for people to be asserting that marginality. Because uh, on one hand, there is this attempt to uh, judge your oppression or marginality on the basis of standards that have been set elsewhere and are not 
applicable to your context uh, while at the same time using that threshold to continuously either validate or invalidate certain experiences that you have specific to your context uh, so yeah the, the fact that any generic myths such as this that all women of uh, any region including the northeast are empowered is i think a complete myth that needs to be yeah. a complete bias that needs to be busted to its core um, with that we will just quickly move on to our next um, um, bias but before that let me just announce once more uh, we are taking questions from people so if anybody has any questions just go to the zoom uh, group chat and start typing it in as soon as we start receiving questions we will start addressing them one after another uh, so the next uh, bias that we will be addressing is that uh, the people from the northeast are also racist uh reena and lekhi over to you for this one <laughs> lekhi please start mm. now this question i find is uh, often time raised uh, when there is a racial attack on north eastern people outside of the north east and the north eastern people are also also racist that there is reverse racism right Mm, now for me this this question is highly uh, counterproductive because what it does is that it is not really uh, effectively does not really answer the question you don't really get a uh, answer to this question but what you what one ends up doing is that you observe any kind of racial attack uh, uh, on the northeast northeast into one anyone right i mean the logic of this question is quite uh, uh, simply that mm, if uh, uh if you are being you are violent right how can you then call violent if you are violent to someone else right um like something of that effect right so it's almost like uh, it's almost like saying that one form of violence will uh, eliminate the other form of violence so there is no one to be accountable uh, and uh, there be no uh, uh, um, what it does is completely kills the scope for accountability right and that is why i find this uh, uh, this kind of uh, statement highly problematic because it does not take the conversation any further we have to keep in mind also in the northeastern region that uh, that uh, that the, the the contact to the outsider right that the experience of the outsider um often times has been that of the outsider as highly uh disruptive and highly oppressive right now uh, when you have that kind of outsider and you meet that kind of out, uh, outsider you build up certain perceptions based on those kind of fears now i'm not again i'm not here um, undermining um, the 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 highly of course uh, problematic questions of us and them that you find in not only in northeast but everywhere around the world right that there's this aversion to uh, the outsider right uh, however we have to contextualize that the northeast also consists of really small communities right that uh, that for us to identify as we now also said uh, to identify to our clan to our tribe right so that actually gives you a, a, a sort of a plethora of uh, communities with really real issue uh, or with, with really real demographic issues right so the fear of the outsider uh, in the northeast should also be contextualized here right and we are also looking at a place that is highly filled with resources and so on and so forth right so where does this uh, this accusation of northeast being racist come uh, come from it, it, it comes from the fact that the same kind of aversion that you might find somewhere else you find it just in northeast like i have been reiterating since the beginning that like any other society we are also we are also complicated we are complex we have contradictions and so on and so uh, so forth right uh, but at the same time i find this uh, uh, this bias highly highly dangerous because it what it does is effectively is just just uh, diminishes the scope of accountability it's always uh iterated when there is a racial attack on the northeast on northeastern people right as if to say that it's all right then right so the logic itself is mistaken and of course it does not take history into account hmm 
Mm. Yeah, I I do uh, agree what Lakey has just uh, talked about. You know, it, uh, it, the the accusation of reverse racism coming only only at a point when there is a racist attack in 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 the mainland of the country. So that then it takes away the accountability, um, because you know when you do that, it's it's uh, almost as if uh, it's it's legitimizing, um, or not not legitimizing, or taking away the very uh, complicated his historical and political reality that the region has endured for a very long time. Uh, the, this this region has still still in turmoil, has many unresolved issues. And the fear of an outsider that was always there with the with the uh, resentment towards the Indian government and all of that, it, it is still a political reality. And uh, to simply say that, oh yes, not racist, uh, it, it's, it's a very dangerous rhetoric. But at the same time, I'm also, we are also, I think I will speak for both Lekhi and I, that we are not negating that it's a very peaceful land where people love each other and live in a utopian world. We have a sense of community that we live together. We partake in a lot of, you know, social activities and all of that. But at the same time, there is an immense rift and division between the tribals and the non-tribals. And, and in fact, within the tri within the tribals in the community itself, I come from a tribe called Nishi in in Arunachal. We have a lot of issues with other tribes. Uh, there's a certain sense of power dynamics that goes on that that has always uh, resulted in a very violent uh, you know outcome so so we will have to somewhere come uh, you know come together in understanding that why is this happening uh, and it, it does not the answer is not just in uh, again pitting one community against another but rather trying to understand the complexities of the discourse and having a very uh, uh, Having having a good understanding of the historical and political consequence of this uh, dialogue. Um, all right. So uh, we really need to hurry because I think we have uh, like crossed. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah we've taken a lot of time. <laughs> they are also waiting. No, obviously, like these are very important issues, and these are extremely uh, difficult. Uh, conversations to also have uh, because many of them require a lot of engagement. But uh, yeah, if you could hurry this up, this is the last myth that we will be addressing today, people. Um, and that is that no, people from the Northeast are not very intelligent. Uh, Reena Lekhi, I would really appreciate if you could like thoda. We are intelligent. We are as intelligent as anyone else. We are as intelligent as anyone else. <laughs> No, um, I think, uh, you know, again, uh, this is, uh, 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 I'm not trying to romanticize here uh, and, and romanticize any community here, right? But there is some kind of, there is a model of, uh, not intelligence, let me call this a model of genius and talent hmm. that mainstream India has, right? That the talented person or the genius is the one who speaks English, first of all, impeccable hmm. English, right? The genius and the talent is someone who is outspoken. The genius and the talent is someone who is not timid, but will also be not aggressive, right? Would not shake the boat. So in that sense, you're going to find that uh, uh, a lot of times, this is something that even I have heard of uh, about myself too, is that, you know, Northeastern people are very timid, they're not outspoken and so on and so forth. Um, and they struggle with academics, they struggle uh, doing anything to do with the brains. Again, what you're seeing is you're seeing the reproduction of, uh, uh, of the, 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 the uncivilized and the civilized binary, right? Uh, when I was, uh, uh, I studied in LSR too. So when I was joining LSR, uh, the person who was uh, uh, checking my admission card without even looking at my marks said that, you know, it's English honors, it's going to be very tough, you won't be able to cope, right? Uh, now, of course, it was my face that uh, allowed them to pass that judgment, right? Now, um, 
uh, I also feel that again we need to really, really. The other thing, of course, is the idea of a reservation. Half the time, this is also brought in because uh, everybody assumes that everyone from the northeast has got into the places due to reservation. They don't reserve this, uh, deserve the seats they're sitting in, just like uh, uh, the Dalits. They don't reserve. Uh, they don't deserve the position, the space they're occupying, uh, because somewhere they have over the years interchanged uh, meritocracy and merit to unreserved categories. Right, uh, and in this, I would like to say is that um, that uh, reservations were not meant to address only economic issues, economic uh, uh, injustice. It was there to address historical injustice. Right, both Rina and I are uh, first generation to second generation educated women. That too, right? Uh, and and we are living in 2020, and we still have a good number of first generation students coming to various institutions in this country who is going to be accountable for the fact that uh, 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 that that my grandparents were not uh, educated my father and mother were not as educated and so on and so forth right uh, and now and we all know we have all studied uh, carefully and looked carefully at least observed around carefully right um, if if talent and genius is about how we present ourselves how we speak Right, uh, you pick it up at home. Right, who is going to tell? Uh, who will be accountable for the fact that most students coming from the northeast might not come from a home uh, that is as talently, talentfully, and geniusly in a genius manner articulate? Right. So we are actually this this which seems as inter- unintelligent all actually struck deeply into the structural lack that you find in uh, uh, in the communities coming from. Uh, uh, from the northeast, and actually in the communities everywhere, uh, uh, amongst the Dalits, among I mean communities that have been historically marginalized. This is a very uh, great tactic to invalidate people coming from here. Mm. Mm. Oh, I I will take that last point of Lakey and take it forward. Absolutely, you know it's always a historically disadvantaged groups in history, uh, uh, always always being seen as. Uh, say uncivilized or not mer- meritorious or you don't deserve the the socio political position that one uh, uh, you know earns uh, like like she said again you know we are first generation female from uh, from our families who have come this far I mean, you cannot even imagine the amount of institutional political barriers that we all had to come come through I remember in uh, my my uh, college days uh, in in 2009 uh, there again, when I was standing for elections in my college, I was told by my some of my professors, who I don't want to name, uh, that uh, you will never win the election because, you know, and that that's that was it. She didn't even have to uh, finish the sentence. I got it, and I was so angry. I went and stood for the election, I, and I became the president of my department that same year. Uh, so it's a daily, uh, you know, experiences of indignity and. Uh, reminder of our incompetences and in- intellect, which, uh, which, which we don't know, really baffles me. That why do we have to go through this? Uh, is 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 anyone from New Delhi asked? Oh, are you intelligent enough? No, nobody as- is asking. In fact, in fact, you, the the very day you step in the classroom, you are being seen as oh, oh, oh kota wali, you know, uh, st kota wali. So, where is this coming from, and why do we need to do this? And the second part is more important. Why do we even need a, need an ST quota? Why do we need a reservation? We have already discussed it at length of you know uh, uh, being being at the periphery of the country and having been marginalized for so long. Uh, it's it's the, it is the responsibility and accountability of the Indian government and the people of this country to accommodate us, our interests, our politics, and see that we are also being respected and given the same opportunity as Dalits and other minorities who deserve it because this country is. For all of us, and not just for the privileged upper middle class who do not uh, uh, understand the history and politics of this country. Yeah, yeah uh, thank you so much, actually, for raising this. We have turned this uh, entire idea of diversity and inclusion into this meritocratic structure where we believe that there are people who have merit, and then there are people who need to be given like affirmative action. 
mm-hmm. but they don't see them as overlapping concepts at all. They're like mutually exclusive concepts of some people having merit and some people needing reservation. Uh, yeah. And I think that is a very flawed concept in itself. So yeah, everyone, like I think this myth is busted thanks to both our friends, Lekhi and Rina. We will now start taking questions. There seems to be some technical issue with the chat box. So what we will be doing is anybody who has questions, just raise your hands and uh, we then we can uh, unmute you so you can ask your questions. The first question that we'll be taking uh, is from Shahina. And uh, uh, you already unmuted her, so, so please go Hi. ahead. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Um, so uh, I wanted to ask this question is that uh, in the Northeast, there is a, a, you know, a heavy presence of the army and there is, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, these acts of AFSPA, which have uh, uh, been there for a while. I wanted to understand from a woman's perspective, how does this affect your life in a daily basis and how does it affect your family life and work life? Hmm. So, uh, uh, we are from, both Rina and I are actually from Arunachal and uh, we need to put it across here that Arunachal has had a very different relationship with the Indian state. Uh, we almost have an umbilical uh, cord between the, uh, the, 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 between Delhi and uh, Arunachal Pradesh, right? Um, however, even there you would find that uh, but however, in, in terms of Manipur and Nagaland, you would find that the Indian army has shown its most violent face there, right? And uh, it is, um, and I can't speak for them, but the few friends that I have uh, uh, who have uh, witnessed uh, atrocities of the army are completely disillusioned actually by, uh, by not only the Indian state, but also their own state. Right, that uh, at the end of the day, what gets played out often is again uh, uh, gender gender violence is often played out, and it comes from both without and within. And the Indian Army have uh, the face of it uh, uh, in the Northeast. If you look at um, the the highly uh, unfortunate and awful uh, incident of the killing of Manura Mathangam in Manipur, and the kind of uh, 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 response that uh, many women's rights activists, in this case, uh, women's group, uh, uh, the Mira Paibis and all of that. So there is a history of uh, the Indian Army um, having uh, this kind of uh, a relationship. But apart from that, there is definitely a relationship of dis, uh, distrust and, and, and fear. And wherever you'd find that uh, 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 Indian Army or any, any kind of uniformed uh, personnel, especially who are not coming from the same community, uh, you would find that there is often fear, uh, uh, girls uh, fear, uh, where I come from now, they have uh, uh, put uh, another uh, a new battalion of CRPF uh, have come there. And you would see now women are getting scared to move, right? So you see that, uh, so the, 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 the reputation of the uh, of the military, of the Indian military has uh, exceeded it and has come to the Northeast and, and uh, incidences of, of, uh, of sexual harassment, incidences of any kind form of harassment is not uncommon there. Do you have anything to add? Uh... Okay, now. Yeah, this is interest time. Maybe move to the next question. Oh, we have me? a few other questions. So. All right, we can actually move to the next question now. Hello, uh, can you hear me? This one is from... Yeah, we can now. Okay, I'll just take Hello. the next question. Uh, this is from Anam, Anamitra uh, and they ask, could you maybe also talk a little bit about biases within academia? Uh, maybe Reena can start with this and then Lekhi, you can add on. Mm. Yeah, uh, you know, the the last uh, bust, uh, sorry, uh, bias that we we're trying to bust of not being intelligent enough or, uh, you know, the daily, the, the constant struggle of proving your intellect is, is something that um, uh, I mean, I, I don't have uh, uh, 
I mean, we could go on and on, but I think uh, just to keep it short, uh, it is as discriminatory and uh, biased as any other uh, institutions that we could think of, uh, especially as female again, uh, I think you, you occupy that space in a very different way. And uh, the, the power relation that you share with, uh, uh, and then another male, uh, you know, colleague, that is again, very, very different altogether. So I don't know, Lekhi, what do you, what do you have to add? The, I think we have answered it in the last uh, session, I think. Yeah, the, uh, so the bias in academia, of course, there's a very clear bias in, uh, mm -hmm. in academia that mm -hmm. you find. Uh, and that bias is, uh, is, is long drawn. This bias is coming from the fact, first of all, if you look up, uh, in, and I hope, I'm, I'm guessing you're talking about Indian academia per se, right? Mm -hmm. So in the Indian academia, um, in the Northeast, particularly in research-based academia, so we're talking about ME and above. Uh, what you're going to find is that the Northeast is uh, not really invisible, but very misrepresented. So if you actually go to the archives and we actually do a research, and that's something that uh, I did in my master's, I tried to go in, and gender was my interest, and I, 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 I tried to look up uh, uh, literature on gender in the Northeast. And uh, and I was um, I was young, so I was quite amazed to find there was a huge number of books that post uh, 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 post civil officers, army officers would write, and they would uh, basically what they would do is reproduce this exoticized way of looking um, to the northeast and so on and so forth. Now, however, that was the first generation of writing that you would find in Northeast, predominantly people uh, not from the Northeast talking about the Northeast, but that too in a way that is uh, highly distorted. Uh, uh, but you'd also find second wave of research that there were writings coming from the Northeast by the people from there. Uh, but there too, you would find often time, and this is where I find feminism very useful, uh, is because you could see the problem that uh, this, in some sorts of research that you find that same kind of models are reproduced and stereotypes are, uh, are reproduced, albeit in the manner where, uh, again, it is romanticized, it is justifying the fact that we are not barbaric, we are not this, we are not that, we are beautiful, we are peaceful and so on and so forth. So in, in academia, uh, the easy way uh, was for the longest time that either you completely misrepresent and exoticize or demonize the Northeast or you exoticize and romanticize. Um, effectively dehumanizing the entire uh, uh, region. Um, but uh, what Rina also said, it also comes from this uh, kind of distrust that there might not be a, a legitimate research coming from there. And it is completely uh, wrong. We have very good researchers coming from the Northeast uh, by researchers coming from this uh, uh, this region. We have, uh, uh, we have historians like Amalendu Guha, we have literary writers, uh, uh, Nanda we have Dolly Kikon now amongst us, we have Tiplut Nongri. So these are people who have actually been writing about their specific region and writing uh, uh, and have done uh, amazing research on, uh, on it and have also been, uh, to a certain extent, uh, found their space within the world of theory and, and, and um, academia. Now it is the responsibilities of institution. The politics is also about institutions, right? So there is, and it's not just in Northeast, like Delhi University and JNU still happens to be the two big institutions. Right? Any research coming out from there is great, but what happens to state universities, right? So we also need to actually start looking at decentralizing the, the education system in India. And, and of course, uh, then try to put in, and wherever we are, like Rina is there, I'm there, wherever we are, whatever spaces we occupy, we try to push uh, 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 this region into academia as much as uh, possible. Unfortunately, that's all uh, we have right now. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, Lekhi and uh, Rina. So we have one question from Sanjana, which is next, uh, which is the mainland mainstream Gay, uh, the mainland mainstream gaze to represent the Northeast as a homogeneous block is occupied and limited to exoticizing the culture of the region. For example, the idea of Northeast fests in mainland India are mostly always about dance performances and ethnic wear and how beautiful our culture is. 
uh, could you please talk about the implications of the same? So this actually borrows and continues from what uh, Lekhi was talking about in her previous uh, point. Um, um, so how I look at it is, um, is this, right? We are used to the, the, the model that is going on and everybody is comfortable with is, is that, uh, that the subaltern should not speak, right? Uh, that the Northeastern would dance, the tribal would dance, the Adivasi would dance for us. And uh, therefore, as you said, uh, that we will simplify ourselves as these exotic uh, objects to be exhibited, to be looked at alone. As long as we don't speak, uh, our minds, um, uh, we are all good. And, and, uh, and that is a long-standing uh, trend that I had spoken earlier also. Uh, that uh, that this is the it seems like this is the only way that the northeast uh, would be unproblematic would be um, unthreatening undestabilizing is to just make us cook and dance right and we need to rock that boat uh, and and we can rock that boat by holding all our representatives uh, uh, accountable, representatives in not only academia, representatives in sports, in culture, in media, in in cinema, uh, that sometimes uh, we we will have to uh, speak as uh, 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 as a, as people coming from a historically marginalized region with our specificities and so on and so forth. Yeah, uh, to, to add to Lakey's uh, points, um, you know, it's, it's so convenient to always uh, portray us in one uh, image that really works for everyone, um, that is exoticizing us and especially the women from the region. Um, but the danger to me here is reducing the region as to mere, you know, uh, cultural and uh, a very you know, putting it in a very romantic cultural aspect is, is so wrong because then we reduce our existing political security issues uh, to, to, to nil, you know. What about the issues of human rights violations, gender-based uh, violence, uh, the issues of development, of unemployment, uh, all of these are never being talked about. But come, um, you know, Northeast Festival, uh, we are at the front cover and page of newspapers and magazine of, uh, you know, of, 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 there's a natural music festival or Nagaland's Hornbell and all of that. But, but, the, but, but the mainland's uh, will towards knowing beyond that pages of exoticization is something that we all need to start talking about. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. We will take one more question and this is the last question and this is from Neerath. Uh, he's asking some author, so uh, could you please ask one on my behalf, uh, some authors writings they would recommend that help understand the Northeast better. So yeah, if yes. you both could take that. Uh, hmm. So, okay. Uh, There is, uh, uh, what are the list that I have in hand is specific to uh, states, uh, writers from the states writing, and also a, 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 a writer, a, a, a that apologies, I think from Norway who's written it. But um, and anyways, if you read any of these books, you'll get a sense of how do you start. Because uh, anything, I feel like any good research on the Northeast will speak about history, right? And if you talk about history, they will have to take every, or the or entirety of this region into account. So uh, I think uh, for Nagaland, there is In the Shadows of Naga Insurgency by JLJP Wouters, W-O-U-T-R-S. There is a brilliant book called Being Mizu, Identity and Belonging in Northeast mm -hmm. uh, by jo Joy Pachua. There's, she's a historian from JNU. Uh, there is the peripheral center uh, uh, that I think you'll find in Zuban, edited by Preeti Gill. Uh, uh, a really interesting and fascinating set of um, essays that looks at gender in the Northeast and looks at uh, um, uh, the armed forces and the uh, uh, effects of that. 
Dolly Kikon's work is also very interesting in terms of anthropology. She's done some great work. Um, if you look at Assam, if, you, if you're interested in material history and Marxist uh, perception, Amalendu Guha's work, uh, uh, Planter Raj to Swaraj is uh, an interesting uh, book. Nandana Dutta's book on identities in Assam. These are the few names that just, um, uh, that one can think of. So, uh, so these are writers in the uh, academic way. Where if you want to read academic uh, researches, uh, you can follow these writers. But there are also uh, uh, writers of uh, uh, of fiction and creative writing. Temsula Ao writes, weaves beautiful short stories about conflict and peace in Nagaland. Uh, there is uh, Mamang Dai from Arunachal. Who uh, again beautifully these stories? Uh, Janice Patriot was uh, 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 a much more contemporary writer now. Uh, Veena, if you have any one in mind, yeah, Easter in Kire, who's uh, yeah, she's written amazing books. I think uh, published by uh, Zuban only. Then uh, I think we could also look at Ramchandra Guha's uh, works uh, on uh, Vera Elvin. And his 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 mm. research on the on the region, mm. then uh, Sir Sanjay Hazarika's books are also there. I think that's a great uh, way also to strangers in the midst region, uh, strangers no more, and other books. Some of them I, I have not read them, but yeah. Then uh, there's so many uh, from Assam mostly, I think, but the rest of the region are just uh, beginning to come up, I believe, and uh, yeah. So we need more writings. Basically, we no, need no. more writing. So read them yeah. and produce as much research and just populate mm -hmm. pieces. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, those are all the questions that we have uh, right now. So I would I would actually start with like talking about this. This has been an extremely informative uh, episode, uh, and it has been able to very perfectly balance between uh, this academic uh, perspective which talks about the structural and the societal uh, oppression or marginalization that occurs uh, in society, specific regard to people from the Northeast, and also at the same time talk about how these myths, etc., in everyday life, apart from it being structural, play out in discrimination and very uh, targeted acts of violence and uh, hoping that sanity prevails and that I'm also hoping that everybody over here who's watching uh, this episode is at home, is mm -hmm. safe and has enough provisions and is comfortable at the present moment. Um, uh, we wish that all of you stay healthy and that this pandemic uh, somehow ends soon. Um, so with that, I would like to thank uh, Lekhi and Rina. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for having us. Integral. And uh, yes, so everybody, uh, we will be coming again in a fortnight with another episode of Bust Your Bias. And we would be tackling another issue uh, which is similarly relevant and uh, pertinent to communities and marginalizations. So yes, thank you so much, everyone who has been attending uh, this and very patiently uh, sat through the entire episode. Um, and yeah, uh, last year, do you have any announcements regarding other events of Belong? Then please go ahead. Um, we have a bunch of events coming up this week. Uh, we will definitely announce them and send an email to everybody. In case you guys want to know more about what we are doing, you can write to us on uh, contact at belong.net and we'll get back to you with schedules or you can write to me directly at lasya at belong.net to know more about its L-A-S-Y-A or uh, to know more about what we are doing. And uh, if you have feedback slash ideas on what our next Bus Your Bias event is going to be like, you can also write to us with that. Uh, and if you want to participate uh, or facilitate yourself and you think uh, there's something that needs to be spoken about very importantly, uh, then yeah, any any of that you can write to me directly on lasya at belong.net or you can write to contact at belong.net uh, and we will get back to you at the soonest. Um, and implement everything that you want. And uh, yeah, thank you, Lakey and Rina. This was extremely, extremely uh, useful. And uh, we 
we I think we managed to burst some very important myths and uh, this is one of the mm-hmm. best and richest conversations we've had at Belong uh, while talking about ethnicity and uh, people of the Northeast uh, as Sanjana would like me to uh, point correct at me about. So yeah, uh, so it's uh, thank you so much for being here again. Neera, thank, thank you, you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks everyone for coming. In addition to what Lassia said, I, I just say that if you, we very frequently post on both Twitter and on Facebook uh, about events. So do follow us if you would, would want to stay updated. Uh, but Reena and Likit, thanks very much for doing this. Uh, I personally found thank it extremely Thank you, Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All thank right. you. Have a good Thanks day. Enjoy your weekend. <laughs>